Good afternoon. Welcome to the Global Report. I'm your host, Lolly, hosting live from Singapore. We have with us today Mr. Larry Bowen, who is the, a Purple Heart recipient, and he is also a survivor of the USS Liberty tragedy that took place in 1967. Today, Mr. Bowen is the president of the Liberty Veterans Association. Welcome to the show, Mr. Bowen. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, Mr. Bowen, rather than having me go into a monologue, could you share with us your illustrious uh, naval career, please? Yes, I, uh, I spent 21 years in the Navy. I started off as a cryptologic technician. Um, so on June 8, 1967, I was a 21-year-old um, E-5, and I was um, on board the USS Liberty in the Eastern Mediterranean on a classified mission for the Naval Security Group, which was actually tasked by um, the National Security Agency. And for my entire 21-year naval career, I, um, I worked in support of the National Security Agency. So wasn't always on board ship. In fact, af after the Liberty incident, I, um, I never had to go back out to sea. Um, but, um, and then after my career in the Navy, I, uh, I spent the next 22 years still supporting the National Security Agency as a defense contractor. So I was still working in the intelligence field, um, doing similar things that I did while I was in the Navy. Um, and it's, you know, I like no. what I did, so. Well, thank you for your service to the country. Now, Mr. Bowen, uh, you mentioned that on June 8th, your ship was sailing out in the Mediterranean Sea. Tell us what happened to that, that day, please. Okay, um, that particular day, I had a, a day watch, which meant that I went to work at about seven o'clock in the morning, and I would be getting off at about 3.30 in the afternoon. Um, I was what's called an R brancher, which meant that I took international Morse code. Um, typically, I would be sitting at a posit or a position um, listening to military communications and typing. And uh, those messages would be either plain text or encrypted. And then our processing in the recording section would take those uh, messages and depending on the urgency or the criticality, they would report them to higher echelons. That morning, um, like any other morning, was, was fairly typical, as, I mean, from a day watch perspective, except that around, I'm gonna say 9.30 or 10 o'clock, um, the work that I was doing became extremely important. I had somebody behind me. Um, every time I finished typing a message or copying a message, they took it over to, to make sure that it got reported immediately. Um, and at lunchtime, my buddy, Bob Eisenberg, who was um, a 23 year old sailor and on his last cruise in the Navy, he was due to get out in, in August. Um, at 11 or 11.30, he and I went to lunch together. And he told me that what I was doing was very important and that they knew that something was gonna happen. They, that there was, the plans were that something was gonna get hit the target they talked about, but I didn't know who the target was. Um, so that later that morning, early afternoon, the skipper decided to have a, um, a general quarters drill. When we do these, you know, periodically on your cruises, just to make sure that the crew is, is ready in the case of an emergency. 
Um, uh, just to interrupt you there, sorry, Mr. Bowen, when you said you were intercepting the signals and you know doing some interpretation, are you a linguist too or? No, I, as an R brancher, um, I was actually a cryptologist, but not a linguist. The, the linguists were the people that were taking these messages and the, you know, either determining what it was, if it was an encrypted message, they might have to decrypt it. Uh, that would have been something that I could have done, um, but- Were there any linguists on board that day? Oh yes, yes, we had um, various linguists. We had Russian linguists, we had Hebrew linguists, we had French linguists, um, probably Spanish linguists. Um, so there were, there were a number of different linguists. We picked up a couple of linguists in Rota, Spain before we went into the Eastern Med. Um, three Marines came on board and one civilian. So it was our normal cruising area was off the Western coast of Africa. Uh, so, you know, coming up into the Mediterranean was a very unusual assignment for us. Uh, but we were, you know, we go where we're told. And, so uh, there was not, that was not your normal route. There was not oh, your- Oh, absolutely not. No, we, um, we were already on station off the Western coast of Africa on May 23rd, when we got orders to go up into the Med immediately. And so we immediately went up into Rota, Spain to pick up these additional personnel and to bring on additional supplies and then head over into the Eastern Mediterranean where we couldn't tell anybody where we were going, how long we were gonna be there or anything. Um, and like I said, the, the skipper getting back to the preliminary drill, um, we went through our normal routine for a, a drill and finished up at about 1.30 in the afternoon. At two o'clock that afternoon, we were attacked. What I didn't tell you was that from 7.30 in the morning until about one o'clock in the afternoon, we had been overflown by Israeli reconnaissance planes so we felt pretty comfortable, Israel being an ally, we, we felt that, you know, we were in safe territory. Um, how, we, how did you know that those were Israeli planes? Were they marked? Oh, yes. Yeah. The Star of David was clearly marked on the planes. And we have, you know, our, our shipmates were out, you know, doing normal routines topside. So they, they saw the planes, the planes were low enough in some cases where they could actually wave to the pilots. So it was, you know, there were no, it didn't appear that there were any hostile intents at all. Did, at the, guys that, on the, did the guys on the plane, were they waving back to you? Yes, yes. So they saw you guys, okay, they saw you oh, guys. yes, mm. yeah. Right. But at two o'clock in the afternoon, unmarked aircraft came out with guns blazing. And, and rockets firing. And they, they hit us with rockets, with cannon fire, with 50 caliber machine guns, with, with napalm. Um, there were 821 rocket size holes topside, over 3,000 50 caliber machine gun rounds that penetrated the skin of the ship. Um, plus the napalm that burned the entire superstructure. And then three torpedo boats came out and launched five torpedoes at the ship. Only one torpedo connected, but that torpedo instantly killed 25 of our shipmates because it hit right in our collection spaces, right in the area that I would have normally been working. Um, the now, now, can you, because um, um, let, let's just go back from the time that the rockets were launched, 
Did you guys try to send out any SOS? I mean, how long between the rockets and the torpedoes? Was there a lapse of time? Did you guys try to send out any SOS signals? Our, we were trying to do that, um, but the, the Israelis were jamming our, our frequencies, all of our you know, international frequencies for, for, for getting an SOS out. So they were monitoring our frequencies, which didn't allow us to, to get an SOS out. But what about your distress frequencies? Because it's, it's, I mean, it's a violation of international law to be jamming those two. What about your distress frequencies? It is a, you know, a violation, but they were still jamming those as well. The intent, which is, which is what's been so frustrating for the crew for all these years, is that we wanted a full investigation so that we could find out why there wasn't a more uh, invest a more thorough investigation by Congress. Typically, Congress would investigate any act of war um, against a U.S. naval vessel, and and that was that was never done. The Navy conducted a seven-day court of inquiry, and the the only thing that they really looked at was something about. Um, a message that was supposed to have come to the USS Liberty telling the ship to move 100 miles off the coast. Um, and, you know, we never got that. It was misrouted to the Philippines and, and several other places, but, but it never got to the USS Liberty. So but let's go back to the day of the attack, the time of the attack. So there were rockets launching. Uh, yes. What was the time lapse between the rockets launching and the torpedoes? Okay, the rockets and the the actual air attack lasted for about twenty five minutes, um, and then the torpedo boats came in, and that was probably forty five minutes after the initial attack by the aircraft. So, you know, the aircraft got out of the area before the Navy came in and, and did their thing with the, um, with the torpedoes. But then the Navy also, while they were there, um, we had lowered life rafts over the side to, because we thought we were gonna have to abandon ship. And we had lowered some life rafts over the side to offload some of our more seriously wounded um, shipmates and they they machine gunned the life rafts which is another you know uh you that's know, also a violation of international law isn't it are you it allowed is. to yeah. right yes it is so um but it, it appeared that the the navy court of inquiry wasn't wasn't looking for finding guilt or any violations in, in terms of international law when they conducted their court of inquiry. The only thing that they seemed to be focusing on was the failure in the US communication system, which is absolutely absurd. I just, I mean, it just, for me, someone who's a communications specialist and you would have thought that anyone that would, had been working in this business for any length of time it would have been easy for them to get a message to us so it's i i can't let this go i i just it still bothers me um now i know that you said the frequencies were all jammed but at one time, I think that one of your shipmates did manage to get a message to Washington. Is that correct? It is. What, what happened was the uh, Israeli fighters, when they were um, zeroing in and attacking, they were using heat seeking missiles. We had one antenna that hadn't been working. So it was, it was a cold, cold antenna. So their missiles, when they came in, didn't, didn't destroy that particular antenna. 
but we didn't have we didn't have a cable going to it that that was operational. So um, one of our shipmates, um, Harry, um, ended up getting a coax cable, going out there, putting his life on the line, and splicing the cable together so that they could get this SOS out. And it, it got to uh, the USS Saratoga, and the Saratoga immediately scrambled jets, and so did the USS America. And shortly how, after- I'm, I'm sorry, ahead. how far was the Saratoga and the America, how far away from your ship were they? I'm gonna say about 500 miles. They, they were quite a ways away. They said they were gonna be within 15 minutes of air support, um, but- was, was that before the torpedo hit? That was, yes, that was definitely before the torpedo hit. Okay. We were still under air attack because, you know, Terry ended up getting, you know, wounded while he was out there splicing these, uh, these uh, coax cables together. When, um, when he got them together, Saratoga got the message, they scrambled the jets, and then almost immediately they had to notify the White House that, you know, what they were doing. And Secretary of Defense McNamara told them to recall the jets. Well, Captain Tully from the Saratoga didn't understand why, but he thought, well, they had been working with a, a nuclear drill. They had armed some of their aircraft earlier in the day just to, you know, for a nuclear drill. So he, they reconfigured their aircraft and put conventional weapons on them and redeployed. And so did the America. And again, they got on, you know, the Criticom to notify the White House that they've redeployed aircraft to come to the aid of the USS Liberty. And McNamara once again said, I told you to recall those aircraft. Admiral Geis got on the phone and said, it's my prerogative. I want it from higher authority. And Lyndon Johnson got on the phone and he says, I don't care if the ship and everybody on board goes to the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea, I'm not going to embarrass an ally. When we put out our SOS, we didn't know who was attacking us because they were using unmarked aircraft. So... But, but just a minute, um, earlier you were saying that when you guys were waving at one another, you knew those were Israeli jets. Yes. So these are different group of jets that flown in to attack you? Yes, this, this group of jets that, that came in were unmarked aircraft. They were all blackened out. So they didn't have any, any markings on them at all. And, and it was a three-pronged attack. I mean, it's, it's not like it was... A so wait, 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 wait a minute. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, so you said these were unmarked aircraft. Yes. Yet, yet, uh, Lyndon Johnson knew that these were aircraft from American allies. Exactly. Okay. All right. And that's that's another question that we, the crew members, have been asking all these years. How would Johnson know that it was an ally that was doing the attacking? if the eyewitnesses on, on site didn't know who was doing it. Now you're a communication specialist. Let me ask you this. How easy it is to, to jam the frequencies of another, you know, an, another ship? I mean, how, because they, it seems like they figured out your frequencies very quickly. How easy is that? Very easy. Um, very easy, okay. Yeah, and there was, I mean, you know what the international frequencies are. Um, the United States can do it. Um, and I'm sure Israel can do it. And most of our, our foes can do it. So it's, it's not uncommon. All um, right, okay. Yeah. So, um, so the jets were recalled, the, the rescue team was recalled twice, I mean once, well, twice, they were twice. recalled twice, and then torpedoes came, and what happened afterwards? Um, 
when the torpedo hit and the prior just before the torpedoes hit the captain you know came on and and said prepare for torpedo attack uh and i mean having never been in that kind of a situation before you you really don't know what to do i mean you 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 sit down on the deck and you brace yourself against a bulkhead and you just hope that you know god's with you and and you do a lot of praying um and where the torpedo entered as i was saying earlier is when when they sound general quarters all of us have different duty assignments some people become part of a damage control team some people become part of a fire control team um, in my case um, instead of staying at the uh, position where i was copying cold i got to move up one deck into another room setting a position doing the same job but it, it just what we try to do is minimize um losing everything you know having we still had the same capabilities we just spread them out in different different areas so i was one level up and when the torpedo hit it it wiped out that bulkhead that i was sitting at earlier and wiped out the entire comm center that was right on the other side of that bulkhead um, that whole area below me was flooded um 25 of my shipmates were killed instantly now and i imagine that is a massive impact to be hit by a torpedo by that time you know how much was the ship listing how much was it tilting initially it it rose up out of the water um we all got blown up you know to the you know you immediately get blown off off the, the deck we hit our heads on the overhead came back down um and you're you're just kind of numb you don't know exactly what happened i mean we knew we had been hit by a torpedo but we didn't know whether we're going down or or what um and of course, we knew we've got all these people down below that we had to try and save. Um, and the listing part, you've got a 29 foot by 40 foot hole in the starboard side of the ship that's taken on a lot that's, of water. That's the and right it, side. Yeah. yeah. And, and so with, with that, you've got with the waves and it was, it was a fairly calm day so there wasn't big waves um but it went to about a, a seven seven to nine degree list so it, it but we were getting some roll there um Clyde Way and I were two of the guys that were sitting in that room together we we both had some injuries but we we both made it out of that room so that we could go outside and try and open up the scuttle and the hatch to start letting the guys that survived down below out before before the water got too high and they, they started drowning. I mean, it was... Now, Mr. Bowen, so all in all, how long was the attack? Uh, I'm going to say between an hour and a half and two hours. It's just, you just, I mean, it's not like you're checking your watch to, mm -hmm. uh, to see it's, it's just time just was, it started at two o'clock and I think it ended by quarter to four, um, is my recollection. So in the span of two whole hours, there was no American aid that came to that came there, was, to your ship. there was no American aid that came to us in the span of 18 hours. It 18 hours. It wasn't until the next day that six fleet assets came to our aid, the USS Davis, the USS Massey, two destroyers, and the USS Papago. Those, those were the first three ships that, that made it to, to come to our aid. We had 
70% of the crew was either killed or injured and, and nothing, nothing was done. Now we're running out of time here, but just to, just to move things forward. Um, so you guys found out that it was the Israeli that were attacking you. Uh, what happened afterwards? I mean, I know the ship was eventually dry docked in Malta and brought back to Norfolk, but what happened? I mean, was you mentioned there was an inquiry that took, was it 10 days you mentioned? It was, it was a seven day inquiry that- Seven that days. Happened, seven days and it happened in Malta. But even before that, when, when we were making the transit to Malta, um, Admiral, um, Admiral, Admiral Kidd came on board and threatened us with imprisonment and fines if we ever talked about it. So, you know, for, for 50 years, I never said anything to anyone about what, what was going on. Um, and what motivated you to, you know, finally come forward and, and share your story? And I imagine you're not the only survivor that's coming forward to share your story, right? No, a lot of them have actually written books and, and spoken out long before me, but I was still working uh, in the intelligence community where I needed my clearances. That's how I supported my family. So I wasn't gonna speak out and jeopardize, you know, losing my clearances. Um, so when I retired in 2008, I guess I felt a little more comfortable. I guess the biggest question mark I have, the biggest question I have is, why do you think the Israeli attacked an ally ship? What was their motivation? Um, my theory is that they were trying to get the United States to get involved in the Middle East war to support them the United States wanted to get rid of Nasser in Egypt and Israel wanted to gain all of their promised land in, you know, like Syria and Jordan and Lebanon. And Golan so they, Heights. Yep. Golan Heights. Yep. So with the United States coming with their strength, I think, um, Israel felt that they had a better chance of, of doing that. Um, we've been told that, you know, we probably helped prevent World War III by, by staying afloat. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Bowen. Uh, sorry that the time is uh, running out here. I'm listening to you. I've listened to you for the past half hour and I'm just kind of assessing the, the situation in the world today. Um, I think we have to manage our expectations because as you know, Middle East is a huge mess today. It's messier than it's ever been. So I think for Congress to want to open up this can of worms and take a second look, the, the chances are very slim. But that being said, that being said, I think your story is very important. And, and I believe that, I genuinely believe that, you know, truth and justice always have a way of finding their way out. And so it's so important for you and the, your fellow survivors to, to keep your story alive and to make sure that's passed on. So that even if we don't see anything happening in our lifetime, that at least that story is being preserved. Thank you very much. And thank you again for having me. Yeah, thank you so it. much, Mr. Bowen. Thank you. All right, thank you.